Good evening. My name is Gareth Seven. There are clearly a number of ways in which a Christmas carol could be introduced. Myself, I am most struck by the happy fortune that enables me on this Christmas to present to you an ensemble of phenomenal actors that have come together to bring to you the world's best loved Christmas story, A Christmas Carol. When Charles Dickens presented this little story to the world, almost 175 years ago, he found an instant response in the hearts of people everywhere who saw in it their favourite fictional chronicle of what Christmas is and what Christmas means to all the simple people of the earth. From the day of its first printing to the very present, families have taken to heart and made a Christmas carol an item indispensable to a proper observance of the most important of days. A Christmas carol, as Charles Dickens wrote it, has by common consent long been a classic. With many adaptations and as many arguments as to who portrays the most convincing Scrooge to our own imagination. Mr. Lionel Barrymore's appearance was first heard in this very same adaptation of the play, and many believe him to be the one true Scrooge. However, with the likes of Alistair Sims, Albert Finney, to Patrick Stewart and Jim Carrey, you cannot argue that the creme de la creme of the acting world have all portrayed this memorable character at some point. And now, here at Studio 7, before we unfold the story once more for your enjoyment, our very own Ebenezer Scrooge, Mr. Glenn Haskell, is here to introduce our play to you. Thank you, Gareth. As the old year draws towards its close, and when Christmas comes, we look about to find some way to appreciate Christmas all the more and bring back a sense of tradition and hope. As Gareth said, to gather around the radio to hear and to enjoy, or to sit and watch on the TV or cinema a Christmas carol has always been a long-time tradition for many good folk. And since it is Christmas, we hope, too, that you will now invite all members of your family to sit with you and listen, before dreams and a visit from Santa. We've got a great deal of pleasure planning and preparing this Christmas gift. And now, it's ready. the wrappings, off come the tags that say please do not open till Christmas. Out comes the card. To you from Studio Severn and all our cast, here is the gift itself. A very Merry Christmas to you all. Studio Seven proudly presents an adaptation of the Campbell's Soup 1939 radio version of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol.
Joe. Come, come in, come in. Marley was dead to begin with. There's no doubt whatever about that. Yes, quite dead. As a doornail. Certificate of death, sir. The register of his burial was signed by the clergyman, the clerk, the undertaker, and the chief mourner. Scrooge signed it, and Scrooge's name was good upon change for anything he chose to put his hand to. Old Marley was dead as a doornail. Scrooge knew he was dead? Of course he did. Scrooge and Marley were partners for I don't know how many years. Ah, but he was a tight-fisted hand at the grindstone with Scrooge. A squeezing, wrenching, grasping, scraping, clutching, covetous old sinner. And once upon a time, of all the good days in the year, on Christmas Eve, Old Scrooge sat busy in his counting house, a grim, cheerless place if ever there was one. The door of Scrooge's counting house was open that he might keep his eye upon his clock, Bob Cratchit, who in a cold and dismal little cell beyond, worked at his ledger. Nineteen, twenty, twenty-one. Merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Twenty-three, twenty-six, twenty-nine, nine carry two. Christmas Day. Seventeen, thirty, seventy-seven. Bob Cratchit. Oh uh, yes, Mr. Scrooge. Stop that infernal caterwauling. Yes, sir. Bitty, Zetty, Merry Gentlemen, Christmas. Singing their idiotic Christmas carols at my very door. Go on, get away from my place of work. Go somewhere else and bellow your blasted carols, or I'll give you. Why, Governor? It's an old custom at Christmas time, you know. Yes, and I don't want any of your old customs. Take to your fellow fools and go away. Christmas. Bleh. Right, sir. Well, Merry Christmas anyway, sir. Ah. Now you get that letter from Higgins and Blackthorn, Cratchit. And then I want you to finish posting this ledger. And after that, you can pop over to Parthgill's and tell Ephraim Parthgill you've come after the 17 shillings and six pence he's owed me since Michaelmas. And tell him I shall have a constable over there if he doesn't pay up at once. Miss Poffager's wife has been ill, sir. Oh, that is bad news indeed. But what do I care about his wife? I want my seventeen and six. I just thought, with it being Christmas and all, that you might... Well, you know, sir, it's Christmas time. Christmas? Christmas? You mentioned that word to me once more, Bob Cratchit, and I'll... A Merry Christmas, Uncle. A Merry Christmas, Bob. A Merry Christmas, Mr. Fred. God save you, Uncle. Bah, humbug. Christmas a humbug, Uncle. Now, I'm sure you don't mean that. I mean just that. Exactly that. Merry Christmas. What right have you to be merry? What reason have you? You're poor enough. Well, what right have you to be dismal about Christmas, Uncle? You're rich enough. Bah. Now, Uncle, don't be cross. Well, what else can I be when I live in such a world of fools? What's Christmas to you but a time for paying bills without money? Merry Christmas. A time for finding yourself a year older and not an hour richer. If I could work my will, every idiot who goes about with Merry Christmas on his lips would be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly through his heart. He should. Uncle! No, nephew. Keep Christmas in your own way and let me keep it in mine. Keep it? But you don't keep it, Uncle. Well, let me leave it alone, then. 
What do you want? Christmas gift, I've no doubt. I came to wish you a Merry Christmas, Uncle. A Merry Christmas? Much good may Christmas do you. <laughs> Much good has it ever done you. <laughs> there are many things from which I derive good by which I have not profited materially, I dare say, Uncle. Christmas among the rest. But I have always thought of Christmas time as a good time, a kind, forgiving, charitable, pleasant time. And therefore, Uncle, though it has never put a scrap of gold or silver in my pocket, I believe it has done me good and will do me good. And I say, God bless it. God bless Christmas. Let me hear another sound out of you there, Bob Cratchit, and you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. As to you, nephew, I wonder you don't go into Parliament. You're talking of nonsense. Oh, don't be angry, Uncle. I want nothing from you. I ask nothing of you. Why can't we be friends? Come dine with us tomorrow. Pa, uh, I think not. Good afternoon. Why not, Uncle? Why did you get married, nephew? Tell me that. Because I fell in love. Ha, ah, because you fell in love? Even more ridiculous than Christmas. Good afternoon. And a happy new year, too. Bah, humbug. And a merry Christmas to you, Bob. And the missus. And to Tiny Tim. Oh, thank you, Mr. Fred. Same to you, sir. Good day, sir. Good day, Bob. Nonsense. Twaddle. Flummery. Talking of Christmas and not two sixpence to jingle together in his trousers pocket. Hey, hey, you there, Bob Cratchit. Come here. What are you doing there? I'm only putting a bit more coal in the fire, Mr. Scrooge. Seeing it's a bit cold in there, sir. You put that coal back into the scuttle. A fire. A fire indeed. I can tell you, if you use that coal at that rate, you and I will soon be parting company, Bob Cratchit. You understand that? There's many a young fella that like your situation, you know. I'm sorry, sir. My fingers... Or getting a little stiff with the cold. Then put on your mittens. There's someone at the door. Go on, see who it is. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. This is the firm of Scrooge and Molly. Yes, sir. I should like to see the head of the firm, if I may. Oh, very good, sir. Please, come right now for cold. Although... I'm afraid it's not much warmer in here. What is it? A gentleman to see you, Mr. Scrooge. Huh? Have I the pleasure of addressing Mr. Scrooge or Mr. Marley? Marley's been dead these seven years tonight. I am Mr. Scrooge. Well, now, Mr. Scrooge, at this season of the year, it's only fitting that we who are more fortunate should raise a fund to buy the poor some meat and drink and means of warmth. You may not believe it, sir. But many thousands are now in want of common necessities. Mm. And hundreds of thousands are in want of the simplest comforts. Huh. Are there no prisons? Well, yes, there are plenty of prisons, sir. And the workhouses? They're still in operation, I trust. I, I wish I could say there are not, but again, yes, they are, sir. The treadmill and the poor law are in full vigor, then? Both very busy, sir. Ah, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I was afraid from what you had said at first that something had occurred to stop them in their useful course. No, sir. All these institutions that you mention are flourishing. But it's nevertheless true that some additional provision for the poor and the destitute must be made. Ah. A few of us upon change are endeavoring to raise such a fund, you see. And, uh, what shall I put you down for? Nothing. Oh, I see. You wish to be anonymous, sir. I wish to be left alone. I don't make merry myself at Christmas time, and I can't afford to help make a lot of idle people merry. I help to support the establishments that take care of the poor. They cost enough. Let those who are badly off go there. Many can't go there, sir. And many would rather die. Then my advice to them is to do so and decrease the surplus population. Besides, I've only your word for it that all this is so. It's the truth, Mr. Scrooge. Well, so be it then. It's not my business. It's enough for a man to understand his own business and not interfere with other people's. Mine occupies me constantly. 
And good afternoon, sir. <sighs> I quite understand, Mr. Scrooge. Good afternoon. Cratchit, show this gentleman out. Yes, sir. This way, sir, please. Sir, I've got an elbow over here. I should like to contribute tuppence. Cratchit! Yes, sir. It isn't much, but it's all I can afford. But there are others who <laughs> are worse situations than I. You're a generous fellow. I wish I might say so of your employer. Cratchit! Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Cratchit! Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Cratchit! Yes, sir. Close the door. Yes, sir. Twenty-four, thirty-one, one carry three. A new Scott tippet for Tiny Tim. A comb for Martha. Thirty-three, three carry the three. A air ribbon for Belinda. Four, seven, twelve, fifteen. Cratchit. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's too late to have you go to Parthgills. You'll be closed up for Christmas like these other fools. We may as well close up the place now. Yes, sir. It is getting a little dark. Hard to see the figures. I, I suppose you'll want the entire day tomorrow. If it's quite convenient, sir. It's not convenient. And it's not fair either. But I suppose I can't do anything about it. <laughs> If if I was to stop half a crown of your wages, you'd think yourself very ill-used, I'll be bound. Well, sir, I... Yes, but you don't think me ill-used when I pay a day's wages for no work. It's only once a year, sir. Once a year? Once a year, indeed. A fine excuse for picking a man's pocket every 25th of December. Man, well, I suppose there's no good talking. You must have the whole day... Well, well, see that you're here all the earlier the next morning. You understand? Oh, I will, sir. I will indeed. Good night, sir, and Merry Christmas. Bye. Merry Christmas. The office was closed in a twinkling and Bob Cratchit with the long ends of his white comforter dangling below his waist, for he boasted no great coat, went down a slide on Cornhill twenty times in honour of its being Christmas Eve, and then ran home to Camden Town as hard as he could pelt to play with his family at Blind Man's Buff. Scrooge, on the other hand, took his melancholy dinner in his usual melancholy tavern, having read all the newspapers and spent the rest of the evening with his banker's book, went to his dismal house. Darkness is cheap, and Scrooge liked it. The yard was so dark that even Scrooge, who knew its every stone, had to grope with his hands through the fog and the frost to find the door. Now, it is a fact that there was nothing at all particular about the knocker on the door, except that it was a very large knocker. Let it also be borne in mind that Scrooge had not bestowed one thought on Marley since his last mention of his seven years dead partner that afternoon. And then, let any man explain to me, if he can, how it happened that Scrooge, having his key in the lock of the door, saw in the knocker, without its undergoing any immediate process of change, not a knocker, but Marley's face. <laughs> Oh, Mama, Marley, is that? <laughs> oh, <laughs> silly old fool. It's, it's just a knocker. 
Yeah, tiredness has gone to my head. As Scrooge looked fixedly at this phenomenon, it was a knocker again. He opened his door, walked through his rooms to see that all was right. Sitting room, bedroom, lumber room, all as they should be. Nobody under the table, nobody under the sofa, nobody under the bed, and nobody in the closet. Closing the door, he locked himself in. He double locked himself in and took off his cravat, put on his dressing gown and slippers and his nightcap. He then sat down before the fire to take his gruel. could have sworn I saw old Bah Humbug Marley's been dead these seven years Humbug all humbug What I need is a good night's rest What? What's that? Someone's in the wine cellar man. The door's locked and, and double locked. And something is coming. Some something is is coming closer outside my door. But I won't believe it. It's humbug still. Marley! Heaven is a scroll! <laughs> oh, no. Shh. What do you... What do you want with me? I want much of you, Ebenezer. Who... Who are you? Ask me who I was. Oh, <laughs> you're very particular. Uh, for a ghost? Uh, all, all right. Uh, who were you then? In life, I was your partner, Jacob Marley. Uh, Jacob Marley? Uh, but uh, you're dead. Uh, you died seven years ago? Seven years ago, this very night. Huh? What's wrong, Ebenezer? Don't you believe in me? I uh, do not. You doubt your senses, Ebenezer? Yes, yes, because a little thing affects them. Slight disorder of the stomach makes them cheat. You... you can't be a ghost. You, you may be an undigested bit of beef or a blot of mustard, a crumb of cheese, a fragment of an underdone potato. <laughs> there. Maybe more gravy than grave about you, or whatever you are. Ah, humbug, I tell you, humbug! <laughs> Do you believe in me, Ebenezer? Do you believe in me now? Oh, <laughs> I, I do believe in you. You are... A ghost, Jacob. Thank you. But why? Why do you walk the earth, Jacob? Why do you come to me? It is required of every man that the spirit within him should walk abroad among his fellow men and travel far and wide to witness what it cannot share but might have shared on earth and turns to happiness. But tell me, Jacob, what is that chain you wear around you? I wear the chain I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard by my own free will. Is its pattern strange to you, Ebenezer? 
cash boxes, keys and padlocks, ledgers and purses. Yours was as heavy and as long as this seven years ago. You have labored on it long since, Ebenezer. It is a ponderous chain! Old Jacob, speak comfort to me. Please, Jacob. Comfort? I have none to give. I cannot rest. I cannot stay. I cannot linger. Weary journeys lie before me. You... you travel fast? Yes, Ebenezer. On the wings of the wind. Ah, uh, seven years dead and traveling all the time. Seven years, Ebenezer. Seven years of remorse. Ebenezer, do you know that no space of regret can make amends for one life's opportunities misused? But you were always a good man of business, Jacob. Business! Mankind was my business. Charity, mercy, benevolence, they were all my business. The dealings of my trade were but a drop of water in the comprehensive ocean of my business. Jacob, Jacob, don't take on so now. Jacob. Jacob? Listen to me, Ebenezer. I'll listen to you, Jacob. Go on now. Speak to me, but don't be so flowery. Ebenezer, I am here to warn you that you have yet a chance of hope of escaping my fate. Do you hear me, Ebenezer? Yes, Jacob. Yes, you always were a good friend to me, Jacob. Thank you. But, but go on, go on, go on, go on. How shall I escape? Oh, I'm afraid, Jacob. You will be haunted by three spirits. Is uh, that the only chance and hope? It is your only chance and hope. Well then, I, I, I think I'd rather not. Without their visits, you cannot hope to shun the path I tread. Expect the first spirit when the bell tolls one. The second when the bell tolls two. And finally, expect the third spirit when the bell tolls three. Couldn't I take them all at once and have it over, Jacob? Ebenezer, look that for your own sake, you remember what has passed between us. Remember, when the bell tolls one, look for the first spirit. <gasps> Marley. Jacob Marley. Scrooge awoke. He was lying on his bed fully dressed. Suddenly, the curtains of his bed were drawn aside and Scrooge found himself face to face with the unearthly visitor who drew them, as close to it as you can possibly be without touch. It was a strange figure, like a child, yet not so like a child as like an old man. Its hair, which hung about its neck and down its back, was white as if with age, and yet the face had not a wrinkle in it, and the tenderest bloom was on the skin. The arms were long and muscular, the hands the same, as if its hold were of uncommon strength. Ebenezer Scrooge. Who? <gasps> Who's that? Ebenezer Scrooge, I have come for you. You? Ah, uh, 
Are you the spirit, sir, whose coming was foretold me? I am that spirit. Who... Uh, what... are you? I am the ghost of Christmas past. Long past? No, your past. But what do you want of me? What brings you here to haunt me? Your welfare, Ebenezer Scrooge. Rise and walk with me. Oh, no, 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 no. Not out of the window. Why, I, I can't do that. Or fall down. I'm not a spirit. I'm mortal and I'll fall. Bear but a touch of my hand upon your heart, and you shall be upheld in more than this. Come, follow me. become of the city. And there, there's so much snow upon the ground. Where are we? These are the shadows of the things that have been. You recognize this countryside? <gasps> oh, I, I know every inch of it, every rock, every tree. And that bleak building over there. Ah, that building. I was a boy there. Yes, I went to school in that horrible place. Do you recollect that path? <laughs> I could walk it blindfold. Strange you should have forgotten it so many years ago. Come, let us go closer. Look through the window into that cold, barren room. What do you see, Ebenezer Scrooge? I see a boy. A solitary child, neglected by his family, alone. Yes, yes, I, I see. I, I know that boy. Oh, I, I was so lonely. Poor boy. Your lip is trembling, Scrooge. And what is that on your cheek? It's nothing, nothing at all. I wish I... I... It's too late now. What's the matter? Nothing, nothing. The waves come to my door singing Christmas carols last night, and there was a boy like that among them. A poor, pale, thin little boy in a ragged coat. I should like to have given him something, that's all. Is that all? Come, Ebenezer Scrooge. Let us see another Christmas. Scrooge's former self grew larger at the words, and the room became a little darker and more dirty. The panels shrunk, the windows cracked. Fragments of plaster fell out of the ceiling, and the naked lathes were shown instead. But how all this was brought about, Scrooge knew no more than you do. He only knew that it was quite correct, that everything had happened so, that there he was, alone again, when all the other boys had gone home for the jolly holidays. He was not reading now, but walking up and down despairingly. Scrooge looked at the ghost and with a mournful shaking of his head, glanced anxiously towards the door. It opened, and a little girl, much younger than the boy, came darting in, and putting her arms about his neck, and often kissing him, addressed him as her. Dear, dear brother, I've come to bring you home. Home, little friend? Yes, home for good and all. Home for ever and ever. Father is so much kinder than he used to be. That home's like heaven. He spoke so gently to me one dear night when I was going to bed that I was not afraid to ask him once more if you might come home. And he said, yes, you should, and sent me in a coach to bring you. 
And you're to be a man. And never to come back here. But first, we're to be together all the Christmas long and have the merriest time in all the world. You're quite a little woman, Fran. Always a delicate creature whom a breath might have withered. But she had a large heart. So she had. You're right. I'll not gainsay it, spirit. God forbid. She died a woman and had, as I think, children. One child. True. Your nephew, I believe. Yes. Please take me away from here, I beg of you. Ebenezer Scrooge. Know it. Know it. This is the counting house where I was apprenticed. It's my old master, bless his heart, old Fezziwig. My master alive again, and hosting one of his Christmas parties. <laughs> oh. Yo ho, my boys! No more work tonight! Christmas Eve, Dick! Christmas, Ebenezer! Let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson! Then pick your partners! Listen to him. Hilly ho, clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Hilly ho, Dick. Cheer up, Ebenezer. Corkscrew. That way, sir. sir. Thread the needle and back to your places. <laughs> Dick Wilkins, poor Dick. Dear, dear, dear. Yes, and look, there's Mrs. Fezziwig herself, looking younger than any of them. And the table's all loaded with roast and cider, mince pie and beer. Oh, what a jolly time we used to have. That carefree young man, with the light heart and the gay smile. Do you recognize him? Yes, yes, yes. Merciful heaven, how happy I was then. A small matter for old Fezziwig to make those silly folks so full of joy. It's a small matter? Small indeed? Isn't it? He has spent only a few pounds of your mortal money. Is that so much that he deserves praise? Oh, it's not that. It's not that spirit. Old Fezziwig has a power to make us happy or unhappy. To make our service light or heavy. His power lies in words and looks and in things so tiny that it's impossible to come to him. The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost her. Ah. What is the matter? Oh, uh, nothing. Nothing at all, spirit. Something, I think. No, no. Speak. Well, only it's just that I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk, Bob Cratchit. Well, that's all. My time grows short, and we have yet another journey to make. Where now? Come. This is our last visit to the past, Ebenezer. Here, in this little room, with a fair young girl by your side, do you recognize yourself, Ebenezer? <gasps> no, 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 no. Spare me this. You're older now. A man in the prime of life. Your face has begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. Your eyes are greedy. The eager, restless eyes of a miser. No, no, please. She knows it, too. That girl by your side. There are tears in her eyes. It matters little to you. Very little. I know that. Belle, have I changed toward you? When we were engaged, we were both poor. Was it better, then? Better to be poor? Better... At least to be happy. You're changed. You were another man then. I was a boy. You blame me because I've grown wiser? Have I ever tried to break our engagement? In words, 
No. Never. In what, then? In a changed nature. In an altered spirit. In everything that made my love of any value in your sight. So, I release you from your promise. Belle. Oh, at first it may cause you pain to lose me. A very brief pain. But soon it will be dim, like a half-remembered dream, an unprofitable dream. And you will be glad to be awake from such a dream. May you be happy in the life you have chosen, Ebenezer, for the lover whom you once loved. That's enough. Show me no more. Take me home. These were shadows of the things that have been. That they are what they are, do not blame me. No, no more, no more. One shadow more. Come. Do you see this man, Ebenezer Scrooge? This man might have been you. And the woman beside him, your wife. And that girl. That girl might have been your daughter, Ebenezer Scrooge. She might have called you father. She might have been a springtime in the haggard winter of your life. Spirit, let me go. Show me no more. Listen now while they speak, Ebenezer. Belle, I saw an old friend of yours today. Who was it? Guess. How can I? It... Oh, I know. Mr. Scrooge. Mr. Scrooge it was. I passed his office window. It wasn't shuttered. And there was a candle inside, so I couldn't help seeing him. His partner Molly lies at the point of death, I hear. And there Scrooge sat all alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, spirit, I can't bear any more. Leave me. Haunt me no more. Take me back. Take me back. You are listening to Studio 7's presentation of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, produced by Gareth Seven and starring Glenn Haskell as Scrooge. A very Merry Christmas from Studio 7. On the stroke of two, Scrooge awakened suddenly and sat bolt upright in his own bed. He remembered the words of Marley's ghost and wondered from which direction the second spectre would appear. At that moment, nothing between a baby and a rhinoceros would have astonished him very much. Now, being prepared for almost anything, he was not, by any means, prepared for nothing. And, consequently, when no shape appeared, he was taken with a violent fit of trembling. Five minutes. Ten minutes. A quarter of an hour went by, yet nothing came. Then, as he sat in his bed, he became aware gradually of a great blaze of ruddy light, which seemed to shine upon him from the adjoining room. He got up softly and shuffled in his slippers to the door. It was his own sitting room, no doubt about that, but it had undergone a surprising transformation. The walls and ceiling were so hung with living green that it looked a perfect grove, from every part of which bright gleaming berries glistened, and such a mighty blaze went roaring up the chimney as had never been known in Scrooge's time, or for many and many a winter season gone. Heaped upon the floor to form a kind of throne were turkeys, geese, game, poultry, great joints of meat, 
suckling pigs, long wreaths of sausages, mince pies, plum puddings, barrels of oysters, red hot chestnuts and seething bowls of punch that made the chamber dim with their delicious steam. In easy state upon this couch, there sat a jolly giant, glorious to see, who bore a glowing torch, in shape not unlike Plenty's horn, and held it up, high up, to shed its light on Scrooge as he came peeping round the door. Come in, come in, Ebenezer Scrooge, and know me better, man. Who, who, uh, who, who... Who am I? I am the ghost of Christmas present. Look upon me. You've never seen the like of me before. You're... You're, uh, you're different from the other spirit. You're tall, uh, almost a giant. And that great torch you carry... It pours into the homes of rich and poor alike. Spirit, take me where you will. Last time I went against my will and learnt a lesson which is working now. If you have anything to teach me, let me profit by it. Touch my robe, Ebenezer Scrooge. Touch my robe! Where have you brought me, spirit? A humble dwelling in a humble street. It's humble enough. Yet there is happiness there. Who who are these people? Who's that woman and, and the children? These are the family of your clerk, Bob Cratchit. His wife dressed in twice-turned gown, but brave in ribbons, laying the table for their Christmas dinner. And there, assisting her is her daughter, Belinda. And the young man with the fork in the stuffing, that's Master Peter Cratchit. And the two little Cratchits. Listen, Scrooge. Martha, oh, is she coming? Is she here? Oh, here's Martha, Mother. Martha! Martha. Why, bless your heart alive, Martha, my dear. Merry Christmas to you. Merry Christmas, Mother. (laughs) Merry Merry Christmas. Christmas! Merry Christmas! How late you are, my dear. Oh, we had a deal of work to finish up last night. And we had to clear away this morning. Well, never mind, so long as you're here now. Sit ye down before the fire and have a warm. Lord bless you. Where's father? He's been to church with Tiny Tim. They'll be along shortly. Who is Tiny Tim, mother? Any better at all? Sometimes I think he is. And sometimes I think... Oh, dear God, if anything should happen to him. Mother, you mustn't even think of such a thing. Here they are, look, 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 there, there they are. There's Tiny Tim. Merry Christmas, everybody. Martha, welcome, my dear. A Merry Christmas, Father. And Tim. Merry Christmas, Martha. Oh, Tim, you darling. Oh, Father, I'm so glad to be home. And we're so glad to have you, Martha. And how did little Tim behave in church, Bob? Oh, as good as gold, and better. I like church, Mother. Oh, they sang the nicest songs. I hope they saw me there. Saw you there? Then why, Tim? Well, don't you see? Because I'm lame. And if they saw my crutch, it might be pleasant for them to remember on Christmas who it was made lame beggars walk and blind men see. Oh, bless you, my son. Yes, children, we're all ready. Come, come take your places. And Bob, wait your turn. There's plenty. Stuffing and dressing and plum pudding for all of you. Martha, you take care of Tiny Tim. Yes, Mother. You see that he eats plenty. He must get tall and well. Now sit down. Sit down, everyone. Ah, now, my dears. Shall we say grace? Spirit, uh, tell me if Tiny Tim will live. 
I see a vacant seat in the poor chimney corner, and a crutch without an owner, carefully preserved. Oh no, 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 kind spirit. Say he'll be spared. Say he'll live. If these shadows remain unaltered by the future, Ebenezer, the child will die. Amen. 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 And now, my dears, with such a dinner, a toast, a Merry Christmas to us all, and God bless us. Amen. God bless us, everyone. And now, to Mr. Scrooge. I'll give you a toast to Mr. Scrooge, the founder of the feast. The founder of the feast, indeed. Who pays you all of 15 shillings a week. I wish I had him here. I'd give him a piece of my mind to feast on. And I hope he'd have a good appetite for it. Oh, my dear, the children. Christmas Day. Well... It should be Christmas Day, I'm sure, on which one drinks the health of such an odious, stingy, unfeeling man as Mr. Scrooge. You know he is, Bob. Nobody knows it better than you, poor fellow. My dear, Christmas Day. I'll drink his health for your sake and the day's, not for his. Long life to him. A Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. He'll be very merry and very happy, I have no doubt. And I'll say God bless him too, Mother, and everyone. There was nothing of high mark in all this. They were not a handsome family, these Cratchits. They were not well dressed, their shoes were far from being waterproof. Their clothes were scanty and had known very likely the insides of a pawnbroker's. But they were happy, grateful, pleased with one another, and contented with the time. When, at last they faded, Scrooge had his eye upon them, and especially on Tiny Tim, until the last. Many calls Scrooge made that night with the ghost of Christmas present, Down among the miners they went, who labour in the bowels of the earth, and out to sea among the sailors at their watch, dark, ghostly figures in their several stations. Much they saw, and far they went, and many places they visited, but always with a happy end. The spirits stood beside sick beds, and they were cheerful, on foreign lands and they were close at home, by poverty and it was rich in almshouse, hospital and jail, where vain man in his little brief authority had not made fast the door and barred the spirit out, the spirit left his blessing. It was a long night, if it was only a night, and it was strange too, that while Scrooge remained unaltered in his outward form, the ghost grew older, clearly older. It was a great surprise to Scrooge, while listening to the moaning of the wind and thinking what a solemn thing it was to move on through the lonely darkness over an unknown abyss whose depths were secrets as profound as death. It was a great surprise to Scrooge while thus engaged to hear a hearty laugh. It was a much greater surprise to Scrooge to recognize it as his own nephew's and to find himself in a bright, dry, gleaming room with the spirit standing smiling by his side and looking at that nephew with approving affability. Where are you? Why, my nephew Fred and his family. Indeed it is. (laughs) He said that Christmas was a humbug as I live. (laughs) He believed it too. Well, more shame on him, Fred. He's a comical old fellow, that's the truth, and not so pleasant as he might be. However, his offenses carry their own punishment, and I have nothing to say against him. I'm sure he is very rich, Fred. At least you always tell me so. What of that, my dear? His wealth is of no use to him. He doesn't do any good with it. He does not make himself comfortable with it. He hasn't the satisfaction of thinking (laughs) that he is ever going to benefit us with it. Oh, I have no patience with him. Oh, I have. I am sorry for him. I couldn't be angry with him if I tried. 
Who suffers by his ill whims? Himself, always. Here, he takes it into his head to dislike us, and he won't come and dine with us. What's the consequence? He doesn't lose much of a dinner. Indeed. I think he loses a very good dinner. Well, I'm very glad to hear it, because I haven't great faith in these young... Oh, do go on, Fred. He never finishes what he begins to say. He's such a ridiculous fellow. <laughs> I was only going to say that the consequence of his taking a dislike to us and not making merry with us is as I think that he loses some pleasant moments, which could do him no harm. I am sure he loses more pleasant companions than he can find in his own thoughts, either in his moldy old office or his dusty chambers. I mean to give him the same chance every year, whether he likes it or not, for I pity him. He may rail at Christmas till he dies, but he can't help thinking better of it. I defy him if he finds me going there in good temper year after year and saying, Uncle Scrooge, how are you? If it only puts him in the vein to leave his poor clerk fifty pounds, that's something. And I think I shook him yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> My life upon this globe is very brief, Ebenezer. It ends tonight. Tonight? Tonight at midnight. Hark, the hour has come. Oh, no, no, not yet, not yet. There, there, there are still more things I wish to learn. These you will learn from still another spirit, Ebenezer. Scrooge found himself once more in his bed, in his dressing gown, and his nightcap on his head. He remembered how the second spirit had just vanished within the blink of an eye. He knew also, in his heart, that the spirit had made a profound impression upon his soul. And then, he heard the clock strike three. He recollected the prediction of old Jacob Marley, and lifting up his head, beheld the third spirit. A solemn phantom, shrouded in black, draped and hooded, coming towards him, slowly and silently, like a mist along the ground. know you. You, you are the ghost of Christmas yet to come. You'll show me the shadows of things that have not happened but will happen in the time before us. Answer me, spirit, ghost of the future. I fear you more than any specter I've seen. Yet I know your purpose is to do me good. And as I hope to live to be another man from what I was, lead on. The night's waning fast, and time's precious. Will you not speak to me? Where are you taking me now? Here? On a common street, spirit? What is there for me to learn here? Who, who, who are those men? I don't know much about it. Either way, I know he's dead. What? When did he die? Last night, I believe. Looks like it's been a very cheap funeral. For upon my life, I don't know anybody to go to it. Suppose we make up a party and volunteer. I don't mind going if a lunch is provided. <laughs> <laughs> Come to think of it, Albert I was his best friend. 
What? We used to nod at each other when we met in the street. And more than once we were known to say bye bye. <laughs> <laughs> Spirit, help me. Who is this man that died? Is there no one to mourn the poor creature? No one to follow him to the grave? Perhaps I'll give him a green grave at least. Perhaps? Oh, spirit, to what do you point now? Have I not seen enough already? What is this place you bring me? Never should a man walk these dank, dark streets. The houses are wretched and the place has an air of bad repute. Spirit, please answer me now. What is this place? Who are these people? This can be no business in this disarray. Just look at the mountainous piles of rags and bones. What reason do you have to bring me to such a place? I fear I may catch a disease just from the air I breathe. Let the charwoman alone to be the first, the laundress be the second, and let the undertaker's man be third. Why, old Joe, aren't you a lucky one that we come here to you all at once? Luck be right, and you couldn't have picked a better place to meet, I dare say. Come on, come on into the parlour, you ain't no stranger to it. Move along, move along and let me shut this door. Oh my, would you listen to it creak? Ain't no shop worth its salt if it ain't got its very own creaking hinges. Oh, a bit like me bones. <laughs> what odds then? What odds, Mrs. Dilber? Every person has the right to take care of themselves. He always did. <laughs> oh, that's a true word right there. And he sure did, didn't he? Most definitely, Mrs. Dilber. Why then, don't stand there staring as if he was afraid, woman? Who's the wiser? We're not going to pick holes in each other's coats, I suppose? No, indeed. We should hope not. Very well then, that's enough. Who's the worse for the loss of a few things like these? Not a dead man, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> If he wanted to keep him after he was dead, the wicked old screw, why wasn't he natural in his lifetime? If he had been, he'd have had somebody to look after him when he was struck with death, instead of lying gasping out his last there, alone, by himself. It's the truest word that ever was spoke. It's a judgment on him. I wish it was a little heavier judgment. And it should have been, you may depend upon it, if I could have laid my hands on anything else. Open that bundle, old Joe, and let me know the value of it. Speak out plain, I'm not afraid to be the first, nor afraid for them to see it. We know pretty well where we were helping ourselves before we met here, I believe. It's no sin. Open the bundle, Joe. What do we have here, then? A seal or two? A pencil case? A pair of sleeve buttons and a brooch of no great value. That's your account, and I wouldn't give another sixpence if I was to be boiled for not doing it. Who's next? Oh, Mrs. Dilber, what you got for old Joe? Now, now, uh, sheets and towels, a little wear in apparel, two silver teaspoons, mm, a pair of sugar tongs, and a few boots, Joe. What do you think? I think I always give too much to ladies. It's a weakness of mine, and that's the way I ruin myself. That's your account. If you asked me for another penny and made it an open question, I'd repent of being so liberal and knock off half a crown. And now undo my bundle, Joe. Bed curtains. You didn't, did you? You took these down, rings and all from around you whilst you were still lying there barely cold. <laughs> you was born to make your fortune, you was. Yes, I did, and why not? He had no use for him no more. I certainly shan't hold my hand when I can get anything in it by reaching it out. For the sake of such a man as he was, I promise you, Joe. Now, don't drop that oil upon the blankets now. Blankets? His blankets? Whose else's do you think? He isn't likely to take cold without them, I dare say. I hope he didn't die of anything catching, eh? Oh, don't you be afraid of that. I ain't so fond of his company that I'd loiter about him for such things, if he did. Ah, you may look through that shirt till your eyes ache, but you won't find a hole in it, nor a threadbare place. 
It's the best he had, and a fine one too. They'd have wasted it, if it hadn't been for me. What do you call wasting of it? Putting it on him to be buried in, to be sure. <laughs> Somebody was fool enough to do it. But I took it off again. If Calico ain't good enough for such a purpose, he ain't good enough for anything. It's quite as becoming to the body. He can't look uglier than he did in that one. And what is this bag of coins, I pray? <laughs> this is the end of it, you see. He frightened everyone away from him when he was alive. To profit us when he was dead. <laughs> Spirit, why, why have you brought me here again? Here to Bob Cratchit's home. Yeah, but it's not the same. What? Why is it so quiet? So very quiet here. Dear, you mustn't. It's almost time for father to be home. Don't let him see you crying. Yeah. Yes, Martha. He's late tonight. He walks slower than he used to. And yet I've known him to walk very fast indeed with tiny Tim on his shoulder. So have I, mother. But he was light to carry. And his father loved him so that it was no trouble. No trouble. Bob! Good evening, my dear. You're late, Bob. Yes, I'm sorry, my dear. I... I went to the churchyard today. I wish you could have gone with me. It would have done your heart good to see how sweet and green a place it is. But you'll see it often. I promised him. Yes, I promised Tiny Tim we'd walk to her on a Sunday. Father, dear. It's God's will, Bob. I'm trying to understand, my dear. My son, my little son, Tiny Tim, and I loved him so. Oh, that's cruel, cruel. Spirit, can't you give me one ray of hope that I may change all that, that Tiny Tim may live? Spirit, I, I see, I see. The case of this unhappy man might be my own. My life tends that way now. Merciful heaven, what is this? Why, oh, why bring me to this fearful place? Have I not learned enough about this man that you must now show him lying there dead to further frighten me? Who was this man? I cannot see a space for the veil understand you. And I would do it if I could. But I have not the power, spirit. I have not the power. This is a fearful place. In leaving it, I shall not leave its lesson. Trust me. Let us go. Spirit, where are we now? Merciful heaven, a churchyard. 
overrun by grass and weeds, choked with too much burying, desolate, lonely, crumbling gravestones. Spirit, before I draw nearer to that gravestone, answer me one question. Uh, are these shadows of things that will be? Or are they shadows of things that may be only? Oh. Will, will you not speak to me, spirit? What is that grave to which you point? Ah, oh, now I see it. Uh huh. Ah, uh, there's writing on that stone. The name on the gravestone is Ebenezer Scrooge. Ebenezer Scrooge! Oh, no, no, spirit, no, no, hear me. I am not the man I was. Why show me this if I am past all hope? Tell me that I can change these dreadful shadows you've shown me by an altered life. I'll honor Christmas in my heart. I'll, I'll try to keep it all the year. I'll live in the past, the present, and the future. And I'll not shut out lessons that they teach. Tell me, spirit. Oh, go on, tell me. Tell me that I can sponge away the writing on that stone, spirit. I beg you, spirit. I beg you. Spirit, I promise. I promise on my knees. I promise, oh, uh, oh, uh, why, what's this, it's my own drape, oh, I'm, I'm home, in my own bed, in my own room. And the sun, the sun's shining, it's clear, it's bright, no fog. What a beautiful day. Oh, glorious, glorious. Uh, hey, boy. Oh, boy. Yes, sir. What? What's today? What's that, sir? What day is it, my fine fellow? Today? What's Christmas Day? <laughs> Christmas Day. Then I haven't missed it. The spirits have done it all in one night. All in one night. Heaven be praised. What's that, sir? Listen, my lad. You know where the poulterer is in the next street. I should say I do. <laughs> An intelligent boy. A remarkable boy. Tell me. Do you know if they sold the prized turkey that was hanging in the window? The one as big as me? <laughs> what a delightful boy. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Yes, my buck. It's hanging there now, sir. Uh, that, that's wonderful. Go down, will you? And tell him to send it to Bob Cratchit and his family on Broad Street. Uh, and mind you, they're not going to know who paid for it. Go along. Hurry, hurry, my lad. Here, here, wait, wait a minute. You have a crown for your trouble. Y yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, and a Merry Christmas, sir. <laughs> and a Merry Christmas to you, my boy. Oh, I don't know what to do. I'm as light as a feather. I'm as happy as an angel. I'm as merry as a schoolboy. Merry Christmas! <laughs> a Merry Christmas to everybody. A Happy New Year to all the world. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> My dear sir, how do you do? I... I beg your pardon? Well, you sir, aren't you the gentleman who came to my office in regard to that charity? Why, yes sir. A Merry Christmas to you. Uh, yes sir. Allow me to ask your pardon, sir. And will you have the goodness to accept? I prefer to whisper this. What? But Lord bless me! My dear Scrooge, are you serious? If you please. No, not a farthing less. <laughs> a great many back payments are included in it, I assure you. <laughs> Will you do me that favor? Well, my dear sir, I don't know what to say to such generosity. Now, don't say anything, please. Come and see me, will you? Will you come and see me? I will. I will indeed. <laughs> thank you. I'm much obliged to you. I... Thank you fifty times. Bless you. 
Merry Christmas. Next morning, Scrooge was early at his office. He went early for a reason. If he could only be there first and catch Bob Cratchit coming late, that was the thing he'd set his heart upon. And he did it. Yes, he did. The clock struck nine. No Bob. A quarter past. No Bob. Scrooge sat with his door wide open that he might see him come in. At last, he came. His hat was off before he opened the door, his comforter too. He was on his stool in a jiffy, driving away with his pen as if he were trying to overtake nine o'clock. Fifteen and twenty-one, six and carry the one, twenty-four and carry the two, thirty-one and eight and nine. Cratchit. Yes, sir. Step this way, Cratchit, if you please. Yes, sir. Cratchit. What do you mean by coming in at this time of day? Why, I am very sorry, sir. I am behind my time. You are? Yes, yes, sir. I think you are. Oh, it's only once a year, Mr. Scrooge. It shall not be repeated. I was making Reverend Mary yesterday, sir. I'll tell you what, my friend. I'll not stand this sort of thing any longer. And therefore, Bob Cratchit, I'm about to raise your salary. Mr. Scrooge? Are you quite yourself, sir? No, no, thank heaven, I'm not quite myself. Merry Christmas, Bob. <laughs> Merry Christmas, my good fellow. A merrier Christmas than I've given you in many a year. I shall raise your salary, and we'll see what we can do for Tiny Tim and the rest of your family, huh? <laughs> we will discuss it this very afternoon, after a Christmas bowl of smoking bishop. Bob, make up the fire. Make it up. And, and buy another coal shuttle before you dot another eye, Bob Cratchit. <laughs> Scrooge was better than his word. He did it all, and infinitely more. To Tiny Tim, who did not die, he was a second father. He became as good a friend, as good a master, and as good a man as the good old city knew, or any other good old city, town or borough in the good old world. Some people laughed to see the alteration in him, but he let them laugh and little heeded them. His own heart laughed. That was quite enough for him. He had no further intercourse with spirits, but lived upon the total abstinence principle ever afterwards. And it was always said of him that he knew how to keep Christmas well if any man alive possessed the knowledge. May that be truly said of us, of all of us, and so, as Tiny Tim observed, God bless us, every one. You have just heard our performance of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, starring Glenn Haskell, brought to you by Studio 7. The cast in this production were as follows. The narrator, Gareth Seven. Ebenezer Scrooge, old and young, Glenn Haskell. Bob Cratchit, Rocky Westbrook. Young boy, Gareth Seven, Fred, Ted Wenskus, the gentleman collector for the charity, Stephen Walker, the ghost of Jacob Marley, Peter Lutz, ghost of Christmas past, Larry Oliver, ghost of Christmas present, Dexter Heron, Fezziwig, Owen McEwen, Belle, Zoe Jenkins, Belle's husband, Gareth Seven, generic girl, Zoe Jenkins, Mrs. Cratchit, Julia Eve, Martha Cratchit, Sarah Pinnell, Tiny Tim, Stephen Walker, First Gentleman, Tom Fellers, Second Gentleman, Gareth Seven, Mrs. Dilber, Natalie Winter, Charwoman, Lillian Rachel, Undertaker, Carrie Michael Ayers, Old Joe, Terry Cooper, Fran, Zoe Jenkins, Scrooge's niece, Natalie Chisholm, The Cratchit Children, Zoe Jenkins, Gareth Seven, Chloe and Joni Denhart. And now, a final message from Tiny Tim. God bless us, 
everyone. Thank you for listening and Merry Christmas.